Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today. My name is Amy Bryant. I'm a psychotherapist here in Atlanta, Georgia at Wild Child Counseling, and I do parents education classes online at Parenting Beyond Punishment. And I'm here today with Patty Whipfler of Hand in Hand Parenting. If you are unfamiliar with Patty or with Hand in Hand Parenting, you're really in for a pleasant surprise today. I did a, a professionals training with them a couple of years ago. And one of the weeks, Patty joined us, and she is just a pleasure to listen to and to learn from. And she um, is a true light and advocate for both parents and children at the same time in a really lovely way that I think you're going to appreciate. Uh, Patty is the founder of Hand in Hand Parenting, and she's also the author of Listen, Five Simple Tools to Meet Your Everyday Parenting Challenges. Patty, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Amy. I feel honored to be part of your, your uh, conference here. Uh, thank you. So um, what we're going to talk today about reaching for our children, um, and, and you're going to talk about some fresh tools for frazzled parents, and I think most parents can relate to that feeling of being <laughs> frazzled. Yeah, it comes with the territory. <laughs> it really does. Um, so tell us a little bit about this new paradigm that you're talking about for parenting and why it matters. Well, I think the old paradigm for parenting, the one that I was brought up under and the one that, you know, is kind of out there in conventional wisdom is that it's the parent's job to control the child's behavior. And it's the parent's job to do that with tools that either go in the um, rewards direction or the punishments direction. Um, disincentives might is a more polite way of, of uh, speaking about it. But, in, in, you know, if your child is doing something that doesn't make sense or that is, you know, hard on you, you either bribe them to do it differently or you make life unpleasant for them in some small or large way. And spanking is part of that, that paradigm. And what is what we've discovered is, and what I've been working with for more than 40 years, is a paradigm that goes to the heart of who we are as human beings. And the motivations with rewards and punishments are just that, you know, child, children want life to be pleasant, you know. And, um, but the rewards in terms of connection-based parenting are that we all have a deep need to be connected with one another. We have a deep need to have strong, close safe connections with other human beings and children's lives depend on those connections. If children don't feel connected, they don't thrive and literally they can die if they, if they don't have enough connection in their lives. It's really a, it is a vital need and children want to feel close. They want to feel connected. They want to have fun with you. They want to play. They want you to understand them. They want to be with other people that is really a very basic need and so parenting by connection is a whole new paradigm where you're using your child's need for connection and you're using your understanding of how when children don't feel connected how they can get to feeling connected again by you coming in and offering connection and if there's emotional tension in the way if they feel sad or feel scared or feel worried about something or feel um, feelings from a bad incident that happened to them at school today and they aren't connecting, their behavior is really off track and, and uh, unhelpful, then as you try to connect, feelings are going to burst forward. You know, they're going to want a third cookie and you're going to say no and all of a sudden there's going to be a 20-minute cry about no cookie that is actually probably related to something that happened in preschool or school today that was really hard. They, they just couldn't digest it. They got home. They're very demanding. You said no to their second or third demand. And now all of the hurt is pouring out. And the understanding is that these emotional moments are prime moments for building safety and connection between parent and child that when we pour in caring and listening and they pour out, you know, awful feelings, um, they are relieved. Something inside them is healed in a very deep way. And our love goes in right to the place where they need it the most and, um, you know, fills a need 
that they couldn't have filled any other way. And so you can improve children's behavior and change a whole family by learning to listen to your children and allowing emotional release in terms of allowing lots of laughter, allowing tantrums and being pleased with every tantrum as the gateway to new learning and allowing, you know, crying and screaming and what my parents would have called having a fit where your child is kicking and sweating and thrashing and really, really deeply upset by getting close and supporting a child through that, you are supporting them to offload the terrible feelings inside that keep them feeling separate and um, unconnected to you. And when you've listened through that, children feel close, they feel connected, and their behavior really changes in a dramatic way so that once parents get this new paradigm of how to listen to feelings rather than try to suppress them and try to control the behavior, um, families really start bobbing along on a very even keel, you know, and there are cries here and, and play and laughter there, all necessary, kind of like emotional poop needs, you know, just like clearing out, clearing out the system so that good things can happen. Um, and this is hard to do because yes. we were never listened to. Mm -hmm. We were told how to be good. And if we weren't good, we were shut off in our rooms or hit or yelled at or called, you know, called names. I mean, bad things happened to us when we did not, when, when our behavior couldn't, our parents were struggling to control our behavior. And so that's what leaps out of us when our children start to have an emotional moment. And so really one of the most important tools, the one I probably will emphasize here is what we call listening partnerships for parents, where you find a parent who also wants to parent the way they've always wanted to, but find that they're too angry sometimes or too frazzled sometimes or just too exhausted sometimes or they don't can't feel like they love their three-year-old anymore or their three-year-old is being hard on the baby. Um, you know, they take that situation, talk about it with another parent for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then that parent then talks about what they want to improve in their parenting and where they get caught so that each person become, learns to be a listener and each person learns to use a listener in order to offload the tensions that we carry um, because we love our children so much and because life ain't perfect. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Know? Yeah, and well, so that's this listening partnership that is... Yeah. Kind of the, it's one of the keys to having an easier and, uh, I don't know, warmer, more rewarding life as a parent is finding a way to allow somebody to pour respect and caring in so that you've got something for your children that's new and fresh. It's kind of a, a double paradigm shift, right? Because on the one hand, we're saying we don't have to ignore our children when they're having a hard time and tantruming and misbehaving, as we often call it. We can actually give them attention because attention is what they need. Mm -hmm. And then we're also making this shift to, it's okay to be upset. It just means that we have to take care of ourselves and get our own needs met. Okay. And that listening partnership helps, helps us get what we need. I love that, that piece of it. I mean, in, in, in my way of thinking, I think parenting is a lot like neurosurgery. It's like no neurosurgeon goes in there all by themselves to do, to, you know, to cure the patient. <laughs> <laughs> it is impossible to do it well. You cannot, you will do harm if you try to do it all by yourself. Yes. And it's not quite that stark with parenting, but um, it, it is, you, you need, you need a team. You need, you yeah. need a certain kind of assistance that, pours in caring and respect towards you so you've got something to give your children and uh, yeah it's a great analogy because it is about our children's neurological growth uh, you yes. know yeah um, and and their whole body I, yeah. I love that example so um, you talked a little bit about listening partnerships um, and that is one of the tools that we can use for ourselves for when we're frazzled um, what are some more things, what are some more ways that we um, can connect with and listen to our children? Um, we have five listening tools with, with, with Parenting by Connection. And there's no one tool that you could leave out and have things go really, really well. They, they really are, they all 
work together and they all work on the on the idea that what you want to do is connect when things are not going well there's some some difficulty in connection and sometimes we have the difficulty in that we bring a bunch of feelings to a situation and every time that situation arises all those feelings are triggered in us so we're caught in rigid behaviors um, that you know have have not worked the last 10 times we did them Um, so it would be better not to do them but we don't know how not to Um, so it's just you know that the listening partnership helps us with you know um, releasing enough emotion so that we're not responding in such a rigid way so that we can actually try something different Um, and with our children there are four parent to child listening tools and one is what we call special time which is really giving your child you know a a little period of time where they know they have you 100% just you and them so you kind of have to you have to organize this so that the baby is sleeping or so that You know, your older child is out at scouts um, and you can be with your second and and your third one is, you know, a sleeper. You send them over to the neighbors to play for a little while. Um, What I used to do as a single parent was with my boys that my best way of doing special time during the week was having a friend who played well with both of them come over. And so I would do 20 minutes of special time with my first son while this friend was playing with my second. And then I would do 20 minutes of special time with my second son while the friend was playing with the first. And then they would play well together because they both had had an infusion of love and attention and play from me. So they were doing, they would do well together and I would do 20 minutes of special time with Moshe, who was their friend, which really made him part of our family. It really, I, mean, I feel very closely connected with Mo. Oh yeah. And, um, that's some creative problem solving. So, <laughs> but it's just, you know, they know how long it is. You set the timer and then they get to do whatever they want to do. And um, they'll find lots of creative things to do together. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit of reading the same book that you've already read them a hundred times before they actually get the idea that they could ask you to walk outside in the rain in your bare feet you know, oh, and yeah. um, oh no, the worms are in the puddle. No, we want you to step <laughs> in the puddle. You step in the puddle, and then you, you know, oh no, there's worms in there. And they laugh and laugh and laugh, oh, and yeah. it becomes just a really fun adventure where they're challenging you to do stuff, and you're, you know, mock mock uh, protesting, but they get to be in charge of you. And so parents sometimes call it, you know, you're in charge time or. Um, kids rule time or you can call it anything you want but children learn to they they learn what it feels like to be connected in that way to have your 100% attention and after a period of time children will notice when they're losing their good judgment you know when they are drifting away from you and they can't feel you there and they'll go you know daddy I, I need special time can we have special time now and so that they don't have to go sock the baby in the family in the belly to get attention. They know what attention feels like. They know they don't have enough of it. They can ask for it. So it's a very, very useful, um, it sort of sets the groove for connection and it's a way to reset connection. So your child doesn't have to act out after school. You just do five minutes of special time with them when they right when they get in the door and then that, feels the need for connection and they can play well with other people, other kids in the family for a while. So play listening is the second one Mm -hmm. that is really playing to promote laughter, not by tickling, but often by playing less powerful role. Um, Children love to get the best of grownups. And so you, you know, you lose at games, you know, if they want to play a board game, you know, when, when the roll of the dice doesn't go your way, you go, you make your little um, token fall on its side and go, oh no, you got me on that one. And then they can laugh and laugh and laugh or, or when they cheat, you know, and they, you know, they get a roll of seven, but they do, they do eight. You go, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought that was seven. And they go, na, 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 na. Oh, <laughs> no, I can't believe you did that. And you just don't take it all seriously. You just, 
you know, they're setting you up to take, take the less powerful role so that they can laugh and they can let off tension about, you know, being out of control of most things all the, you know. Right. The, yeah. Well, what do you say to parents who are really worried? Like, well, if they cheat, how do they learn to do the right thing? <laughs> they know they're cheating. They're playing. They're playing. They know, yeah. Yes. It's really, adults get really confused that yes. play is, you know, the children know that it's the play space. They know that they can imagine anything. Uh, here's an example. Yeah. Um, there's one mom whose child had been, had, had, many, many doctor visits, many illnesses, just a whole history of ill health. He was two year, two and a half or close to three. He was going to meet a new doctor. It was going to be an hour long um, doctor visit. The, the child had to come. The doctor had to see the child, the child that they, the parent and the, and the doctor really needed to talk in a deep way for a whole hour. And this child had never, ever, ever sat through a doctor visit. He was all over the place, you know, feelings would come up, you know, just restless, distracting, very difficult to handle during doctor's visits all the way through. And this mom thought, well, I'm going to try special time and see if that helps him calm down during this doctor visit. So we're going to visit Dr. Jane. We're going to go today. Um, but first, let's do half an hour special time. And what do you want to do? I'll do anything you want to do. And he said, well, I want to play with my stuffed animals. So... Um, they're playing with the stuffed animals and he says, mommy, what should we do with the stuffed animals? And the mommy says, well, do you want one stuffed animal to be Dr. Jane and the other stuffed animal to have a, have an exam? And he goes, yeah, mommy, let's do that. And so they were playing stuffed animals for five minutes. And then he goes, mommy, I want to kill Dr. Jane. You know, <laughs> the mommy goes, oh, okay. You know, good mommy knowing, you know, that this, this is the play space. Okay, how do you want to kill Dr. Jane? He said, I'm going to get the potato masher. So they go in the kitchen, they get the potato masher, and he starts mashing Dr. Jane. And then he goes, Mommy, I want to cut up Dr. Jane. We're going to cook her and eat her. <laughs> He's going, well, it's getting more exciting. So, well, how are we going to do that? Well, get the frying pan, Mommy. And they, then they get a spoon, and they, you know, they mash the animal, and they don't actually cut it, but they pretend to cut it. And then he pretends to eat Dr. Jane, and he feeds Dr. Jane to Mommy, and he's laughing and laughing. And Mommy's going, oh, my gosh, poor Dr. Jane. And he's laughing and laughing, and Daddy walks in. And he goes, what's going on here? He goes, Daddy, I'm killing Dr. Jane, and we're eating her, too. <laughs> he goes, oh. And he manages to kind of like, you know, not interfere. And they go on playing. I'm killing Dr. Jane for 20 minutes. And then mom says, okay, special time's up. Now we have to have lunch. Then we're going to go see Dr. Jane. In the car on the way to see Dr. Jane, he goes, mommy, I wasn't really killing Dr. Jane. We were just playing with my kangaroo. <laughs> mommy goes, right. yeah, I know. Uh -huh. That was really fun, yes. huh? Goes, yeah, mommy. And they get there and he sits with rapt attention listening to Dr. Jane for a whole hour. It wow. had met her mom, the mom never imagined that it could be like that. Doctor examines him. He's very interested. He pipes up with some information when she needs it. It's like an entirely different boy. Right. So you can, you know, there's lots of things that can happen in the play space that really free your child to be a better person um, yes. in real life. And you have to just, you have to, I mean, if they start trying to mash Dr. Jane with a potato masher in real life, you, you, it's just your responsibility to stop it. It's like you can stop, you can stop your child from doing crazy stuff, and you need to, right. but right. it doesn't usually happen. Right, and it doesn't need to happen in play. No. no. Yeah. And then the other two tools are setting limits. Very, very important. You want to set limits at the first whiff of, you know, off-track behavior. And what we call stay listening, which is, you know, moving in when a child is upset. Maybe you've set a limit or maybe somebody just stepped on their toe. And you just offer your presence and make the situation safe and just go, yeah. Yeah, Bobby stepped on your toe. I'm so sorry. And they're crying and crying, you know. Make Bobby say I'm sorry. Make him say I'm sorry. Well, we're not going to do that right now, sweetie. First, let's just... I just want to be with you about your toe. We'll figure out what else to do. You know, and just you let your child cry and you don't try to solve anything. Mm -hmm. 
like crying heals the hurt as long as someone's pouring in caring while a child is pouring out bad feelings. Yeah. There's a healing process that goes very, very deep and rights all kinds of wrongs so that children at the end of, you know, crying about Bobby stepped on my toe, just go, okay, I'm done. What's Bobby doing anyway? Oh, yeah. You know, you want to go play with him? Yeah. You know, hop up, yeah. go back with Bobby. There's nothing to solve. No hurt feelings. It's like right. it's over. There's no resentment. Um, this is how you dissolve sibling rivalry is by listening to all the times it goes wrong um, so that the wrong can be healed right then and there. It doesn't pile up over time. Right. So those are the tools, you know, special time, play listening, setting limits um, without yelling the limit or just expecting a child to children when they're off track, they cannot, they cannot mind themselves. You know, you, you call them from across the room and say, you know, don't hit your brother. Um, if they've already started hitting their brother, they have told you that they can't think. Their mind is off track. Mm -hmm. And yelling a limit is just going to disappoint you because they are temporarily out of their mind and cannot, they, they, don't, they don't, they can't feel your caring they can't feel they're caring for anybody, and so the behavior is going to continue. They can't stop it by themselves. If they could have stopped it by themselves, they wouldn't have hit the brother in the first place. So as soon as brother starts getting hit, you have to be kind of, I think Tasha Shore, my co-author in, in my book, calls it being a superhero. It's like superhero limit setting. You swoop over there and you just go, uh-uh, not going to let you do that no lecture, no, no, we don't hit in our family, da, 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 da. And they, they can't process any of that. You just stop it. And if you can be a safe enough person, they will have a big cry about whatever it was that drove them to do that nutty thing. And when the cry is over, they're not going to be nuts anymore. Right. They will have gotten it out of their system. Yeah. And slowly but surely, when you listen over time, there's less and less cred in their system. So their behavior is on target more and more and more of the time and every once in a while something will flare up because something hard happened in school today right. or because they didn't get their reading assignment done on time and they feel disappointed in themselves or whatever but um, life really smooths out when you begin to connect with your child at the most opportune times mm. and at regular times besides that right i think there's something uh refreshing about or freeing, I guess, about knowing that we can be there with our children and they're upset without having to fix it. Yeah. Um, and this is also something that I know a lot of parents need support with. Like, how can you just be there without saying, oh, you're okay, that didn't hurt, or, um, you know, what, what should we do? Should we go tell him how you feel? You know, that kind of moving in where we almost feel anxious about it, that we have to fix it. Mm -hmm. But there's something freeing about knowing we can just step back and attend to our child yeah. Yeah. Um, and that they'll heal themselves. There's a profound trust in children's intelligence that, um, that you get after watching, you know, 10 or 15 times, watching a child come through a big cry or a big tantrum mm -hmm. and, then, and then be so able to connect with other kids, so able to solve social problems uh, without your help. So the whole thing about making children say they're sorry. I, I never do that. What I do is I, I validate the child. It's like, oh, you know, this is really hard. I'm sorry this happened. You know, Bobby, Bobby might have been a little upset. I'm sorry he got upset, you know. And, but, you know, he's still your friend. And then watching children work it out with each other. You know, sooner or later, the kid who stomped on the other kid's toe is going to either say they're sorry or figure out a way to play with the child that they just hurt as long as someone respects them and can listen to them now and then, you know, while setting limits about, no, I'm not going to let you push him on the slide. You know, I'm going to put my hand on your tummy so you can't. Mm -hmm. And then when they feel the limit, you know, they peel out into a big cry mm -hmm. and you listen. And then they don't have to push anybody else all day long. It's just, you know, the, the urge to be aggressive goes away because mm -hmm. you poured your caring in and it went right to the place where they needed some connection. Right. Um, I really like the, um, 
you know, you think about how triggered we become as parents when uh, someone hurts our child or if one sibling hurts another sibling um, and we want to go in and solve it, right? Uh, and I love when you talked about how we can hold that space. You know, you said like, you know, we're not, I'm not going to let you hurt them and you're mm -hmm. holding the space, but you're not trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. And then as they begin to feel better and heal, they're able to move back into that relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it just makes that sibling relation, it nurtures that sibling relationship mm -hmm. in a way that us solving really cannot. Yeah, yeah. Like when you're doling out ice cream and you've got siblings that are feeling that things are unfair often, you know, one of them is going to look yes. at the other one's ice cream and go, you know, he's got more than I do. But there's this right. little piece that's sticking off the edge that makes it look like a lot. Right. And most parents just fall into it. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll weigh them both. Or, oh, I'll give, I'll give you a little more dollop. And that doesn't heal that inner feeling of things are unfair, things are unfair. But if you just say, yeah, that ice cream part is kind of sticking out, isn't it? You know, fix it, fix it, get me some more. No, sweetie, I'm not going to get you some more. I think you've got a good amount of ice cream there. And then they can cry and cry and cry about how unfair you are. You don't care about them. Um, you never care about them. They never get what they want. Their brother always gets more. Their sister always gets more. And you listen to that and you just go, yeah. And then, all, and then the ice cream is melting because they've been crying and and offloading all of this hurt. And it's like, it's melting. It's not going to be any good. <sighs> well, we'll figure something out when, when you're done. I want to stay here and listen because you're really important to me. You never do what I want. And more, you know, more hurt pours out. And by the time they're finished, you know, the ice cream is all melted. And, you know, but they're feeling better. And they look at the ice cream and they go, Mommy. Can we put a little cinnamon on that and make like a cinnamon swirl? And you go, sure, we could do that. And so you pour a little cinnamon on and they're happily swirling it around. Mommy, this is the best ice cream mush I've ever had. And then all of a sudden it's like the sun comes out and they're happy with what happened. It's really, you don't have to fix a thing. Mm -hmm. And then you're not playing whack-a-mole with this is unfair and that's unfair. And you're not trying to make the feelings better. You got a ton of feelings out and they feel really happy and satisfied with everything for three whole days <laughs> until it rolls back in and they want to right. peel off another layer of tension about how unfair life is. Right. So there are a lot of rewards with listening, although you have to listen to how bad of a parent you are over and over and over again. <laughs> But then you go to your listening partner and you go, I'm afraid my child is right. What if I am a horrible parent? What if this right. is a cockamamie kind of approach and, it, and it's all wrong and they're going to be damaged by what I'm doing listening to them? And you can cry there about your fears about not being good enough. Get right. that out of your way. And then you're more relaxed as a parent and a better listener. So everybody gets to move forward with this um, set of tools. Right. And it's nice because even if this wasn't modeled for us, we really can grow in these skills right along with our kids, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and so you're going to get better at it. You're going to feel less stressed out over time um, and you'll be unloading and healing right, right along with your kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're going to make big, wild, flaming mistakes. I mean, oh, even, gosh, yes. even our most experienced instructors who've been doing this for eight years, it's like their child hits 13. And all of a sudden, you know, all of their, I don't know, stuff about having been a young teenager kind of begins to infect their relationship with yeah. their teen and they start worrying and, and then they, you know, make, you know, they yell and they da 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 da. da and then they, I mean, we all, we all fall off the wagon again and again and again, myself yeah. included, myself yeah. included. And, and, you know, life just ain't perfect, not for parents, not for anybody. And, but if you have a listening partner, whatever got you, you can actually get ahead of that. You can heal some of the hurt that, you know, that clouded your thinking at that moment. And you just get better, you know, more and more stress. I don't know. Um, you're inoculated against the stresses that you have slowly but surely with your own work that you do. 
Right. It really kind of increases your tolerance for that stress that happens, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, you, have listening, you develop listening partners so that when your stress is elevated because your mother is ill and you have to take care of her as well as your kids or your child is suddenly getting a, a D in math and you're just not sure how to help. I mean, you can do more listening. You can, you can, you know, use a, you know, you can beef up your, your support system to meet the challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So how do people find a listening partnership? <laughs> you, have to find one. you have to build it. You have to bump yes. around and make mistakes and build it. And right. To, to find, well, we recommend that people get a little bit of education on how to do this because uh -huh. it isn't like listening in a conversation. It's not, right. it's not like that. And there are some ground rules. Um, but, you know, what you want to do is um, you can find your own listening partner. Um, it's best to try it with someone who isn't, you know, in and out of your daily life all the time, because those people are people that you have an established relationship with. And it's easier to start a relationship, a listening partnership with someone with whom you don't have a complicated relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so a parent friend who you don't know too well, but you see the light in their eyes and you feel the, you know, that they could give you respect, you know, mm -hmm. if, you know, when, and they could listen to you. And um, I don't know, and you just say, hey, well, you want to experiment with this. And it's usually best to present it as, do you want to do this once or twice and then see if we want to continue? You know, do you want to do this little experiment? I think I want to be, you know, I want to work at being the parent I want to be. And I know you're a good parent. This might help. I've been told it does. Um, so let's do this two or three times and then we'll talk about whether we want to keep doing it kind of thing yeah. so that, so that you don't feel like you're asking someone to marry you. <laughs> <laughs> it's less <laughs> pressure, right? My listening partner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody has never even heard of this before. It's like, <laughs> what are you talking <laughs> about? Right. <It's> right. <laughs> so we have a little booklet at Hand in Hand Parenting called Listening Partnerships for Parents. We uh -huh. also have a, a self-guided video that has lots and lots of video clips of, you know, good listening going on between parents um, uh -huh. that might be helpful. And there's a chapter in the book called Listen, um, Five Simple Tools to Meet Your Everyday Parenting Challenges that also gives you kind of the ground rules and some feel for it. Uh -huh. So any one of those sources would be great. And... Um, and then, you know, you just try it. Mm -hmm. Or you can come to Hand in Hand. And we have several <clears throat> community groups, a Yahoo group and several Facebook groups. And you can get in those groups and say, hey, I want, I'm looking for a listening partner. Yeah. You know, Mondays 10 to 12 when my children yeah. are off with, you know, the, I don't know, off at preschool. Yeah. And, I mean, Hand in Hand Parenting is an amazing resource. Mm -hmm. um, I, I recommend their trainings if you're a professional. They have y'all have y'all do parent trainings too. We we do parenting classes mm -hmm. online. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, can, you can get them from any place in the world, and um, yes. yeah, you have a mentor who understands who's been through this oh, and yeah. certified by us, and it'll be a small group of parents, and you kind of get to learn the tools one by one for six weeks. Yeah, yeah it's lovely. It's it's a really powerful way to learn it. Um, we've had multiple people from Hands in Hand come and participate and do videos and talk about the different tools. Um, and so I just always encourage people, go to Hands in Hand. You'll get all more information. You can go incredibly deep and get the support you need and your children need. Uh, it's just, it creates such a nice symbiotic relationship when everybody's getting their needs met. Yeah. It does have a lot of articles so that if you're trying yes. to figure out what to do about sharing in your family or in your preschool, uh -huh. it just sharing is not going well and, and you're always having to time five minute turns and you're turning into the policewoman on the block. Um, yeah. you know, we've got lots of material on sharing, on siblings, on aggression, on sleep, on toileting, on, I don't know, all the, on school, on homework. Um, Even for teenagers. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Even like listening skills for teenagers, because our our teenagers need to be heard. We want we want them to talk to us more than ever. Yep. Yeah. 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 
If anyone has a question and you'd like for us to talk to it, we have a few more minutes. Um, Patty, one woman said, could you please do another scenario for the tactic with the slide? Uh, she said, sorry, I didn't catch that concept. Oh, but okay, okay. Um, so this is when a child has a tendency to lash out at another child um, in a certain way. And that tendency, so let's just say that this child tends to push other kids on the ladder going up the slide, just for an example. I, I, as you can tell, I, I directed an infant toddler center and also I directed a parent co-op preschool. So I've been around little ones a lot. And um, so you, rather than just hoping, oh gee, I hope today, you know, Susie doesn't push anybody on the slide. You, you know, that's, that's kind of your, that is, when that, when that thought crosses your mind, you gotta know, uh-oh, no, 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 that's not a useful thought. You know, the idea is, to do a friendly patrol. So you want to go over to Susie and say, I think I'm going to help you up the slide so that nobody gets pushed. And then you put your hand on Susie's tummy so she can't thrust herself forward and get the kid in front of her, um, you know, at the top of the slide. And you don't, you're not preventing anything. You're just keeping things safe. You're kind of being safety manager. But because you're there and paying attention, Susie can feel you know, what it, whatever aggressive feelings she might be carrying, your attention helps her feel those. And all of a sudden she said, no, no, don't touch me. Well, I need to have my hand on your tummy to keep things safe. I don't like it. I don't like it. You know, well, this is going to keep things safe. You can keep going up the slide. So you're not preventing anything. You're just, you know, making safety happen. And by the time she's at the top of the slide, she says, I need my mommy. And she bursts into tears and you say, would you like me to get you down off the slide, sweetie? And, you know, you take her down off the slide and you put your arm around her and she can cry and cry and cry. And you haven't been mean. You haven't been harsh. You haven't said, now don't push anybody on the slide. You don't do that because she doesn't have control over that behavior. It's impulsive behavior that comes from feelings deep inside. She, hasn't, she doesn't want to push people on the slide. So you just you know, make safety happen. And if a child doesn't like the little piece of safety that you're ensuring, um, you know, they can work on those feelings. You can listen to them. When they're done, you go, you know, you want to go back up the slide now? And you could be uh, sure after listening to a good cry that they're not going to push anybody. So you could say, do you want to wait at the bottom a little bit and then go up? And then I don't have to have my hand on your tummy. And they go, yeah, you know, mm. and they wait and then they go up and they go down and, and they're a safe person to be around for the next three hours. Cause really, I mean, at these young ages, oftentimes in social situations, it's, I, I need my mommy or, or when is my mommy coming back? Or it's really, oftentimes it's fears around separation that make children aggressive towards one another. They don't feel held or connected to with anybody else there with their mommy gone. However, when you listen to a few of these cries after having, you know, prevented, having created enough safety and allowed a child to feel their feelings, they feel, then feel close to you. And they don't, you know, they're not so needy of their mommy being there to keep them oriented in, in their right mind. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. I think it's such a nice uh, reminder that children don't want to be aggressive. They really yeah. want to do well yeah. and to get along and to connect and play and have fun. Yeah. And then there's so many reasons that they might get lost and, and have challenging behaviors. Yeah. Yeah. We had, we had one little boy at my um, infant toddler center who, I had been with since he was an infant and he was four months old, I think. And when he got to the toddler room, he was fine for a while. And then suddenly he began biting kids and we, and hard. And um, we decided to study when he would bite. And he, in general, he bit on Wednesdays and Fridays. And um, we didn't know why it happened on Wednesdays and Fridays and other days were better, but we asked his mom, you know, was there anything going on at home? And she said, no, things are fine at home. But 
I'm taking a class and I'm out Tuesday night and Thursday night and I don't get to see Jonathan at all. You know, his daddy picks him up, you know, as you've seen, and I don't, I don't get home until 930 and he's asleep. I was like, oh, that's why he's biting on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, and so what we did was to have her come and spend 10 minutes with him doing whatever he wanted to do at the beginning of the morning on Wednesdays and then leave and after a few Wednesdays, he began to cry when she left, which was a sign that he could finally feel safe enough to offload. I need my mommy. I didn't get enough of my mommy. And we'd listen to him cry for as long as we could. And she would say a slow goodbye, not a quick disappearance, because that makes it safer for a child to offload the feelings they hold. And on the mornings, we could really allow him to cry for 10 or 15 minutes, you know, as his mommy left. Those were mornings he never bit. And that if we were too busy or something else was going on and we couldn't help with help them with a goodbye, um, those mornings he would still bite because he just didn't get the emotional relief that he needed in order to feel connected and safe there. So, it's, yeah. Well, yeah. It's always communication. I love that. We can really get curious and not just punish it or reward it or... Yeah, there's always a reason. And you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily going to find out the reason. Sometimes you have no idea what the reason is. Mm -hmm. um, but there's always a reason that children cry. And oftentimes the reason lies way back in their very early, um, early infancy. You know, mm. some children just don't have an easy beginning. They don't have an easy birth or they have, you know, their mom has a hard time the first couple of weeks because there's an other things she's worried about or because she feels overwhelmed and and the baby gets scared and kind of holds those feelings inside. It's just, I don't know, there's always a reason. Right. There's nonverbal experiences, right? Yeah. That's yeah. Children even... feel everything that happens to us. They, they know who we are and they know when we're in trouble from the moment they're born um, and before actually. So right. they're very, um, they can read us very fully um, from the very beginning. And when things are scary for us, things are scary for them. Right. It's really amazing how attuned they are. And yeah. Startling sometimes. Yeah. 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 Actually, one time, um, so I raised my children this way, and my older son was crying with me one night when he, I think he was 19, and he'd just broken up with a girlfriend, and he, you know, I laid, I continued to lay down with my sons at night just for the closeness and the connection that, that is so sweet there, and so we were, I was laying with him before he went to sleep, and he burst into tears, and I kind of had my arm around him, and he's crying, and he's about his girlfriend and the breakup and then all of a sudden he goes mom i i remember being a baby and you holding me and feeling so safe and crying and i go, oh tell me more and he said yeah all i can remember is that there was a window on one side and a window on the other side and we were upstairs and you were holding me and i felt so safe just like now and i'm going huh, I don't ever remember being upstairs with you. We never lived in a place that had stairs. And I'm kind of thinking, this is an interesting memory. It probably doesn't, you know, it's probably a bit of a false memory. And all of a sudden I just go, whoa. We, I brought him home from the hospital and we spent almost the whole first month upstairs in a room. And where I nursed him was on a little rocking chair that had one window, it was backed up into a corner and there was one window on one side and one window on the other side. And that was where... I nursed him every single time he, you know, nursed the whole first month. And then we moved out of that place and we never lived in another upstairs place again. Wow. And um, so he was having a memory of the some sometime in the first month of his life. It was so when That's you amazing. listen, to, yeah, when you listen to children, actually they are able to retain access to memories that go way, way back. Wow. Yeah. And not every child does, but it's not an unusual, um, among parents who listen to their children, it's not an unusual thing for a child to pop out with a, a birth memory or a memory of something very, very early that they couldn't otherwise know about. And, right. 
Mm -hmm. Well, suddenly they're in that space of safety where those memories are able to be accessed. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 So, you know, our children's minds are really very fully developed from before they come to us. And, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's delightful to have, to have a practice that allows you to respect your child's mind really fully. Mm. Right. (sighs) Respectful parenting. Well, thank you. We haven't had any more questions. Um, a couple of people said hi, and um, we've had a number of people listening. So, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, is there anything you'd like to add, Patty? Well, I just I think the last thing is that it's you know we all do our very best, and even when we lose it and our you know what we consider horrible to our children. Um, we are still good parents. You know, we have a responsibility to kind of clean things up as, as, you know, as we can, but we are doing our best. And I think we're all really invested in doing a, you know, in, in furnishing as much love as we possibly can to our children. And we need to step back from our worries about ourselves and our parenting and just go, wow, you know, this is, I mean, take a look at how you were raised and then take a look at what you're doing with your children. And I think that most of us would see, you know, an improvement in kindness and an improvement in tolerance and an improvement in setting limits in a, in a thoughtful way. Um, we're all trying to get there and most of the time we do, and that's going to be just fine. Yeah. Yes. Right. Thank you. That's lovely. Okay. Thanks Thank a lot you. for having me on, Amy. Oh, yeah, it's it's always nice to hear from you and speak with you. Yeah. Um, and thank you for being here. Um, if you're a parent or a teacher or other caregiver, um, you can always reach out to Hand in Hand Parenting and check out their resources. And you can also come over to Parenting Beyond Punishment. And if you're in Atlanta, Wild Child Counseling. Um, And so thank you for being here. Okay. Thanks, Amy.